Welcome to Tinfoil Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumours, all with almost believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it's totally founded in logic, reason and truth. Or not. Who knows? Uh, this week we have Dominic and Andrew speaking about wonderful and glorious things in F1. Should we start with what we got right from last time round? I definitely want to revisit what we got right, not like we haven't already done that. Indeed. Uh, Mark upgrades succeed again, F you Dominic. Uh, I feel greatly vindicated about the fact that yet again, uh, Mercedes upgrades uh, have not successfully worked for anything more than a couple of races. Uh, maybe. Uh, they did finish ahead of Ferrari. They did finish ahead of Aston Martin, which I believe were their targets. Yes, but they still didn't really go anywhere else, did they? And they got screwed by McLaren. Uh, Perez misses Q3. Uh, I can't believe that he's done this yet again for four races in a row. I would like to only give us a half point on this one because he also missed Q2. We had an assumption he would be in Q2 and he also missed Q2. I'd forgotten that. I didn't. I, I just was just thinking about the fact that he didn't make it to Q3. Uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, both both are embarrassing. One is more embarrassing than the other. In, indeed. Uh, and he does have the excuse that he's been having a fever and he's not been feeling very well. Yeah, I got a fever and the only cure is Danny Rick in the car. <laughs> Uh, next one was uh, Red Bull will tie with McLaren's consecutive win record, which they did successfully. Slam dunk. Uh, I do think that we should focus more on the win percentage uh, rather than looking at the number of uh, wins in a season because the season's so much longer now. That is true. Uh, all right, Dominic, what is Red Bull's current 2023 season win percentage record? It is 100% uh, and two of those times uh, was Sergio Perez. So do we only count those as like half a win these days? Well, we might as well at this point, because he's not going to win again this season. Uh, but maybe that's too spicy a take. Ooh. He could go well in Mexico, because it's his home race. That's why he does badly, though. And I could see him also doing well at Singapore, because let's remember, he is the street circuit king. True. True. Although, is he after Max won at the last street race? What was the last street race? Miami? Is that a street race? It's got some streets in it. It does have some streets in it. Last one on the Have You Got Anything Right list. Uh, I, this is a late edition that I added after the show, which was that the new tyre construction um, is going to mess with everybody's vibe, except Max, who will win by 35 seconds. I'm going to give myself half a point here, because Max did not win by 35 seconds, thanks to a safety car. Uh, but I do think it messed with everybody's vibe. Yeah, that new tyre construction was interesting, because it seemed like there was almost no difference between the soft and the hard and the medium. Like, everyone was just doing kind of the same lap times. Like... It was a really close field, and all that you all the tires did was change whether you were waiting for them to warm up or they'd gone off. But when they were in the zone, they were about the same. Yeah, uh, and like because like George, he kept those softs on for thirty laps or something like he that. He did, did. He did very well with those. But then Lewis and Max apparently had dodgy tire problems. You could see it with Lewis because he slipped back from Norris, and apparently after the fact, um, Christian Horner was saying that Max had lost all his rear grip as well. Uh, yeah, Max also was complaining about his tires and then setting, like, the second fa- or the fastest sector of the, like, race at the same time. So, classic, uh, Max is learning from Lewis how to properly complain about your tires. Wine first, go faster later. Okay, on to be- between race drama. I think the most important news that we have here, and this is clearly the most important news of the whole season, is that Roscoe is back with Lewis in the UK. He has his BFF. And he will be traveling him for his European races. And it looks like he's so happy. He was carrying him around all over the place. I am also curious about Lewis's uh, new BFF, Shakira. She was also in the paddock this weekend to follow our trend of uh, uh, Hamilton Shakira watch. Indeed. And she was in the Aston Martin garage, which again, I think is a ruse. Just because they don't want it to be too obvious with him in the in the uh, Mercedes with her in the Mercedes garage. Do Do you think uh, Lewis is just kind of dangling Shakira in front of Fernando? Like, hey, look. You you made jokes about dating Taylor Swift, and I'm actually dating Shakira. No, because as I've as I've occasionally hinted at before, actually Lewis and Fernando, it's all just a ruse, and they're just BFFs. And Fernando's like, bring Shakira, put her in my garage, it'll be fine. And then we you know we'll just we're friends. It just works out that way. Okay, more Daniel Sim news. This one's yours. Yes. Uh, more reports coming out of Red Bull that Daniel Ricardo is fast in the sim. Uh, it's interesting enough. Uh, we'll talk about. It, hopefully, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But he is taking part in the Pirelli tire test on Monday, following the British Grand Prix. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. 
Yeah, I, I hope the uh, they release the times just like they did with Mick Schumacher, so we can do some comparisons. I think released Mick Mick and Carlos Sainz were doing the one in Barcelona, I think it was, and I'd love to hear what that those lap times really are. At least, at the very least, we need the internet's finest investigatory sleuths on on the case of what these lap times really mean when all we have are lap times and not knowing the tires or the fuel load or what the tire reduction was. We'll know that there's real politics at play when there's a leak of just Danny Rick's times to the F1 press. Uh, in other news, in the Thursday press conference, uh, Max was kind of asked his thoughts about where he thought for- Formula One cars should go. Uh, I thought it was kind of interesting, considering right now he's talking about not renewing his contract after 2028, which uh, George just thinks he wants more money, which I also thought was interesting, considering how underpaid George is that we talked about last time. Um, But yeah, Max, uh, he wants the V8s back. Um, You know, we've talked about this. I don't disagree. I think the big big thing is also Formula One, I think, has to do something to be relevant in the realm of like, is it a sustainable fuel? Is it a new type of fuel? Something that's not just let's go burn some hydrocarbon around as quickly as we can, because like, I don't think manufacturers are going to want to join in on that. No, I agree. I think everyone has to do something in the uh, realm of being sustainable. And I think, you know, honesty, batteries is probably the right choice. The, the reality is that either it becomes a um, classic only sport or it has to switch to electric. I will slightly disagree with you on this. I don't think batteries are the way forward. Um, I know this is a Formula One podcast, and it's going to be a bit of uh, not Formula One e, but like there's a lot of raw materials that go into making batteries that we just don't have a lot of, and finding something else that we could combust in a way that is more sustainable would probably be a better way forward. I think I would agree, except the reality is is that electric is at least the stepping stone in that direction. I think the physics, the physics and the chemistry behind the sustainable combustible fuels is um, somewhat lacking. That's that's true. But you know, hey, what a better than the pinnacle of motorsport to uh, pro- propel development? But the same could be said for batteries. Maybe we'll find a way to make a battery out of ocean water or something. Uh, you have MBS, the good one, doesn't want to punish Red Bull for being fast. Yeah, I thought it was interesting to hear some comments from the uh, FIA president, uh, Mohammed Ben Suleiman, um, about like what he thinks kind of the regulation should be because you know i think we've talked or we've we've seen in the past where like ferrari had that really dominant season with schumacher in like what 2003 or 2002 where they what they did like four pit stops at portamau to win the race by just like splashing and dashing and putting new tires on every time and then the next season the fi was like all right no tire changes and then kimmy goes flying into the gravel trap because his tire explodes because they're not allowed to change it and he flat spotted it early in the race so like it, it's good to see the FIA being like, no, they got it right. We're not going to try to peg them back in any way because, like, you know, it, it's all it's, sometimes it's always those unintended consequences bits of like, oh hey, yeah, well, now now you can't change your tires, and then Kimmy goes off into a gravel trap in a pretty gnarly crash. Yeah, I think that's the the challenge with trying to adjust it is every time you try to beat. It's whack-a-mole. You fix one thing and they find another solution. And I think the reality is at some point you just have to let the system be. Um, and, and hopefully everybody else will catch up. I'm hoping that maybe the cost cap will help with bringing these closer together rather than forcing it through regulatory choices. Or punitive choices. I think you need a little bit more than just the cost cap because that doesn't do much. Like, the cost cap is nice, definitely. But I think you also need, like, if you were in 10th, you could spend a little bit more money at least on your catering, because like it's one thing to be like, we're behind and at least we get more testing time to catch up. But what are we going to do if we still can't spend the money on the parts? Indeed. I think it, I think Williams's point where they've asked for it in the terms of capital expenditures, an interesting aspect to at least help narrow some of it. It doesn't get rid of it all. Um, I suppose the other thought is, you know, they should just everybody put, put everybody's name into a hat and shake it and you get moved between teams. I mean, that that's a thought. Because then we would truly have truly have the constructor and driver's champion you'd have the aerodynamic champion and the suspension champion Let, let's see max win in a haas oh there was some stuff that went around on uh, twitter of uh, mercedes showing off their engine as part of the new like regulations of every team has to kind of show what their engines are um and i don't know if you follow what engine dan i think it is on twitter um he wanted to know where that ferrari not 2019 engine is and i agree with him I, I want to know what's going on with that because I feel like there's a story there and we surely we're past that point and we can share it out. Like the statute of limitations has passed and we should just 
air all of the dirty laundry. Uh, or we just need an engine regulation that means that's no longer a proprietary technology and we can all find out about it. How they were burning oil. So much oil. Uh, they're probably electing a new pope. Probably. Uh, if we ever do a recap podcast, we need to talk about, I think it was like Bahrain 2018 when there were just plumes of smoke coming out of their uh, their garage. See, that was a pope year. I'm pretty sure that was a pope year. <laughs> Every time they started the car, just cloud of white smoke. It's like, huh, let's see, what makes white smoke? They, did, did they check if Snoop Dogg was in the garage? And we also got the uh, calendar for 2024. It's supposed to be a lot more regionalized. They got close. Still not great. But we all, but as, for, for those audience members who might not know Dominic and I, uh, we are both in computers and the traveling salesman problem is very hard, man. It is very problem. They need to put some proper compute into it. They should use some of, if you can solve the scheduling problem, using your cfd computational stuff you should get more cfd time that's what they should do that that should be the joker if you can solve the, the scheduling problem get everybody in get everybody in a good time save all the planet etc cetera, etc cetera, you can have more cfd time for your aerodynamic models is this like some sort of dykstra's graph where the the uh, the bridget or the um the vertices are the uh the influence of middle eastern oil money on where they want to be in the calendar i, I did think canada's comment canada apparently is one of the t- one of the places that refused to move they said that if they moved it, it would be too cold, which I think is a bit of a porcupine. Uh, I mean, that part of like continental climate is definitely like you can't hold it in December. It's going to be a little chilly. They, they wanted to move it to match. I can't remember which one it was. Now, Miami. They wanted it to pair it with Miami. Ooh, that could still be cold. I know, but it's not going to be like, you know, an ice rink, surely. I suppose it is Montreal. Well, if there's one thing I know about Canada, it can snow in any month of the year in Canada. Well, exactly. So they're hosting it what, in, in June and it could snow in June. So what does it make any difference? The Jeopardy's the same. Uh, China's back on. Do we think it's actually going to happen? Yes, there's no reason to cancel it this year, unless there's a war. Uh, there was also a joke tweet about Checo Perez signing with the new China Formula 4. <laughs> he, he needs it because he needs to learn how to drive a car again. All right, let's move on. Time for one of my favorite occasional segments. Does Blank still have a job? You know, that occasional segment we do every single week. That's why it's occasional. At some point, we won't do it. And then it will truly be occasional. Uh, okay, so number one on the list, Otmar. Uh, I think he is continues to be in jeopardy. Two DNFs, uh, saving grace, at least one of them was not his team. It was Lance Stroll's fault. Uh, which brings us on to number two, which was Lance Stroll. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't great. Uh, yeah, Ram and people off the track. Uh, and then going off the track and getting an advantage, and then getting a black and white flag, it was not a good look for him. He was looking pretty sketchy. Uh, I feel like Daddy had words, or somebody's had words with him, because it was pretty bad. Yeah, that was uh, out of the points, too, on a weekend where, like, the last time Acid didn't look good, at least it was a 1-2 finish, but this was, like, this was not that. Not even close to that. The commentators were asking the question, did everybody else move forward and Aston Martin not go anywhere? Or did Aston Martin make changes that made the car go backwards? And I think it's uh, it's pretty unclear at this point. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they made the car go backwards. We'll see. Uh, then we got Ferrari on the list. I think we'll discuss that with the race recap. It's better to provide it in context. Uh, plus, the, it's like 18 paragraphs of why they should be fired. Um, but moving on uh, to the next person on the list, which was Logan. Uh, he, Logan Sargent, he had his best finish of the year. Uh, in 11th. I think he he might be safe. I think he might make it through the end of the season. I think the question in there with Logan is, though, who would they replace him with? Mick. Oh, yeah, of course. Ready? He's waiting. He's got nothing else to do. All right. Well, then then this has to be another case for, uh, what, Toto being the best dad in the paddock? Because didn't he have a hand in getting Albon to Williams as well? He did. Well, no, 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 no. It depends whether he had a ha- your perspective. He had a hand in almost stopping him. He'd said that he wouldn't allow Albon to drive in it unless he severed all his ties with Red Bull. Uh, we got Perez uh, after the qualifying debacle. Hell no. I'd like to note for the listeners that this is the same line item from the last two times where both times I've said the same thing word for word. Um, yeah, Perez. I, I, I understand that maybe he's not feeling well. I understand that, you know, you have peaks and troughs, but it's ridiculous at this point. And I'm not one to start advocating for the Danny Rick uh, hopium, um, but I feel like it needs to happen. I'd like to hope this podcast is sometimes fueled by Danny Rick hopium. At least, uh, at least good honey badger energy. Honey Badger energy, that's what we need. That's what's missing from the paddock right now. Honey Badger energy. Are you suggesting Brad Pitt did not bring Honey Badger energy? No, he did not. 
Uh, on a sidetrack about that, I saw an article saying that if you look, you should be able to look really carefully and see the two fake F1 cars doing the formation lap and being on the starting grid, obviously before the formation lap, because they'd have to come in. Um, but I tried, I rewatched it and I couldn't see them. So, But they did look pretty good in the static shots I saw. Yeah, I, I saw a couple shots of them running around and looked good. Oh, you saw moving shots? Did you see video of them moving around? I didn't see video, but I saw, I, but they were, no, I did see video. They were running on a Thursday, I think. Oh, I'm gonna have to go and try and find that. So. Uh, the real, I, I wonder how hard that is to like, like everybody just getting ready for the race and you have to be actor and you have to do it in one take. You know, because it's interesting because you don't get a second take. Right. And everybody else is like getting ready to their, do their race and like joking around. And like, meanwhile, you have actor. <laughs> well, they're probably sitting there that they've gone into mode act like when they got in the car. So they can be joking around because they're filming now and they all have to participate in it. And they're already in whatever character is that they're in. Dominic, this is this is Brad Pitt, not Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> Note that Brad Pitt... Is Brad Pitt driving in it? He is driving in it. Sorry, I forgot. I thought he was just consulting and directing it for a minute. But no, he is. He's the old fart. He's playing the Fernando Alonso to the young guys, uh, uh, Lewis Hamilton. Sure, or or any of the other F1 drivers who have retired and come back to some to varying degrees of success. Uh, next item on the list. I know we were going to get rid of him, but I feel like it's worth talking about it because he said something. Uh, Nick, not here to joke around Debris. Um, he came out saying he was not here to joke around. Uh, and I feel like if that's the case, maybe you should drive faster and better. Uh, he was only two seconds behind Yuki. Maybe that's enough to save him. I'm pretty sure he's still going to get fired, but what do you know? Uh, and then this last item, you insisted that we brought them back even after the discussion last week. I think it's very important given Silverstone, um, Zach Brown, I think he's clearly safe. Yeah, he's clearly safe. Um, I, I still have questions about what happened to the team. And I think the more I've thought about it, the more I've concluded that your statement last week, that it's not necessarily that they've got in new people. It's the fact that the person that left was pre- preventing good ideas from being brought in. And I've, I've subscribed to that theory now. Uh, the one thing I will say of maybe Zach Brown's job isn't safe is Lando was rather cross in the post-race interview of going onto the hard tires. Yeah, but he was only joking about it. He was pretty, he was pretty, pretty chill about it. And, you know, the... Yeah. He made it very clear. He said that was Zach's call. <laughs> Okay, should we move on to the quality recap? Uh, Perez, LOL, why did he go out with nine minutes before the session was going to restart and then let his tyres just sit there slowly cooling? I, 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 don't, I don't understand what he was thinking. I don't understand this. It was completely ridiculous. So I think it could have been a case of where I don't... The weather was a bit hit and miss, I think, especially in Q1. And I think the thought was like, it could be the best track to go out. And maybe they just took a little bit more time clearing the car than they thought. So maybe it dried a little bit more because it was very clear, like the cars that went later were doing much better times. Very true. Uh, And I think that they, in some respects, that was also a mistake, but I understood why they sent him out early. I just feel that they misjudged it going out nine minutes early. That was, that was probably ridiculous. Well, they did try to send Max out that early as well. And he strategically bent his front wing off by driving into a, in the side of the pit lane. Uh, and but more importantly, in the uh, Max Verstappen quest to complete all side quests, uh, he ties Roman Grosjean for all time pit lane crashes. Interesting. How many did Roman Grosjean have? I have no idea. I just saw the, I, I saw the tweet and thought it was hilarious and thought it was worth mentioning that uh, <laughs> Ma- Max is, uh, Max's side quests are going well. But yeah, Max, Max. He, he does share that trait with Vettel, who wanted to complete all the side quests, too. Yeah. I mean, when, when you're winning races by 20, 30 seconds, you need, you need something to, to keep you occupied. Yeah, you need something to keep the audience occupied. Uh, we also had a great performance by Piastri and Norris. Um, I thought that was just good, solid work. Both of them did great work, solid. Especially Piastri, who I think at the beginning of the season had been languishing around at the back with a crappy go. Uh, it was good to see him be able to, with a better car, convert to what we, I think, expect of Piastri. Uh, and then last but not least, Lewis tries to pull a Fernando. Uh, yeah, so the astute viewer might have noticed that it took a long time to que- clear that queue in uh, the pit lane at the end of Q1. Uh, so much so they were wondering if uh, you know, Max and Lewis were going to make their way around in order to uh, to set a time. And it looks like uh, Lewis was trying to make it so that Max crossed the line after the checkered flag and could not improve, which, fair play, but I think Max actually went past him at some point in time. Uh, but there was a there was a great onboard, um, I think, from one of the Ferraris, where you just see like Max and Lewis just like yeeting past everybody waiting in line at the last two corners to start their laps. Like, nope, we're going now. 
Uh, and it was it was very funny. It was, but I thought it was uh, typical. There is clearly still bad blood between them, but I think it's just a bad working relationship rather than true hate for each other. Other than that, there there wasn't much to talk about in qualifying. Val- Valtteri uh, got DQ'd for failing to provide a fuel sample. I don't understand how teams managed to do that. I kind of understood it when Vettel got disqualified in Hungary. I understood it was the end of the race. You know, maybe you misjudged it, blah, 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 etc. But how you doing in qualifying? Seriously, people, get your act together. Race recap? Let's talk about it. Uh, so let's start out with great, great start by Piastri. Uh, and and Norris, I think. Yes. I have that written here. It's carefully noted. Uh, given my observation from Austria, where, where in the DRS he kept holding on, uh, I feel like the car definitely has some Red Bull-like DRS qualities because he was doing the same thing. He When he was within that, that one second, he was really holding on. That applied to Max at the beginning and later in the race where he was able to just keep it going. And I think there's definitely a, a, a really slippery DRS quality to that car. Um, but overall, that was that was really good. I think it also speaks to some of the stuff we've seen this year of that Red Bull does not necessarily corner like the best car on the grid like it has in the past. And, you know, you hear Lewis talk, uh, he talked in the cool down room, especially about like how fast the McLaren was going through some of those twisty high speed corners because uh, they were running more downforce. And I think it was one of those, you know, we can gain a little bit of time on the corners and then, DRS our way to stay in t- in contact on the straights sort of situation. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, definitely, everybody seemed to think the car was doing really well. Um, I would like to point out the livery I thought looked way better on the racetrack than it did in the static shots. I think it needed more chrome. Did you see his helmet? I did. He, that's where all the extra chrome went. That's fair. Uh, the Williams is working. Um, I think the Williams did a really great performance. I question whether this is really starting to see the effects of the aero slash budget cap kick in, where... Williams got the most testing time on the CFD, et cetera, et cetera. And like, maybe it's actually starting to have an effect on team's performance. I um, thought that was also interesting. And maybe also McLaren, because they ended up coming behind Alpine last year. And maybe, you know, they got that little bit more, that slightly more percentage, and maybe that's really helping. McLaren's up to fifth in the constructor standings after this race. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, the the opposite of this, though, is Alfa Romeo and Alfa Tori brought massive updates, like basically brand new cars at and it did nothing. That's not true. It ran out of fuel. That's that's a, that's even more opposite of going somewhere. It didn't even get started. But that's the only thing I remember about either of the, all four of those cars for the weekend is that one of them ran out of fuel. Yeah, it's pretty bad. If I was the sponsor, I'd be upset. If I was Audi, I'd be questioning the amount of money I've just put into that team. Um, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that Bottas is not going to get signed in 2026. The the well, that'll be great. He can uh, he can go off on his gravel cycling career with uh, Tiffany and. Right off into the sunset. Uh, so what are Ferrari doing? Oh, man. I mean, I, mean I, I know we always talk about Ferrari flailing around like a dead fish every week. Uh, but then there's a new thing that they do every week, and I just have to talk about it. I mean, converting fourth and fifth on the grid to ninth and tenth. Brilliant strategy. At least they were both still on the points. Barely. Barely. Uh, I think the tire strap was completely messed up. I'm so confused what Charles was doing in the, on those tires. He apparently forgot how to drive completely. Uh, I mean, not only that, but it was it, it, they pitted him incredibly early. I think they were anticipating the uh, like the a, tra- a round of pit stops, and like nothing happened. Like he put it on like lap 19. It was ridiculous. I can't. I don't understand. He was on mediums. He wasn't even on softs. If he'd been on softs, you could be like, well, maybe you just blah blah blah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But he was on medium, and then they stopped him, and nobody reacted. It was ridiculous. Uh, and then we have Sainz uh, towards the end of the race after the restart, where he was told to hold status four. I'm unclear what status four really was. Uh, and then Sainz comes on the radio and says, guys, F that, I'm going to push. Uh, the, the the healthy relationship is non-existent. They, they, they did not. Not good there. And... And he pushed his way all the way off the racetrack and got overtaken by like three cars and five corners. That was so bad. Getting mugged by a Williams, a Williams, admittedly a nicer Williams, but getting mugged by a Williams and then by your teammate and then by somebody else. But then you managed to pull it back was ridiculous. Yeah, but let's not forget that's classic Alex Albon right there. Is it classic Albon I thought was like blocking people because you're such a good defender? In this case, he was going forward and overtaking people. Maybe it's the new classic Albon. That's well, time will tell. Uh, yeah, that was just, that was a shockingly bad race by Ferrari. Shockingly bad. It was, it was so bad. They went from being like, oh, we're the, like, did they get a little bit unlucky with the, the pits or with the safety car? Absolutely. I'm not going to like come here and say like, 
they didn't, but they, they just, they were, they were not doing great before then. No, I, I don't understand what's going on on that team. It is ridiculous. Um, you had a, you had a good comment during the race of like that they script out everything so much and then they refuse to look at anything that might be going on on track. It, it's, there is always a statement when I listen to people do interview with strategists and everybody's like, well, you know, how does it feel when you're on the pit wall and you're making all those last minute decisions and you're evaluating everything that's going on? And every time the uh, strategist is like, we don't. What we do is we run all the situations and all the strategies and we compute them out and then we rank them. And what we do is we go through the race and then we work out which one we're going to do. Makes sense. Kind of understand it. You don't want to be trying to make those decisions in the moment. Um, but I feel like Ferrari goes one step further, which is to say that they print it out and then they follow it. And I'm sorry, we can't print you another one halfway through the race if something changes. And they're just stuck doing the same thing that they do every time. And it's just, it's dumb. Yeah, I mean, there definitely needs to be some sort of situation of like, oh, hey, there's a safety car. What do we do? Oh, hey, there's this. Oh, hey, there's that. What's up with Pirelli? How's that? It's like they don't understand their own tires sometimes because we get like this this graphic that's like, oh, here's the... The tire manufacturer who should know everything there needs to be about these tires. And here's what they say the strategy is going to be. Those soft tires, they're not going to go more for 15 laps. George, it's off into the distance for 30 laps on those damn things. The mediums, oh, they're going to come in on like lap 22, 23. They went all the way to the safety car at like lap 35. This is a byproduct of no in-season testing. They have such limited testing where they can't do all these things, that they don't get that opportunity to try that. I think this is one of those byproducts of not getting that time. I, this this comes back to my whole thing where they shortened the F3 practices to, to 60 minutes, so they had been 90 minutes. They should push them back to 90 minutes, and they should make some of that, should have more mandatory running of test tires or mandatory um, strategies that they must apply so that they can really understand the tires, because they're not getting real-world variation. I, I, do, like, I do wonder how... Pirelli model the tires because they've got the 10 teams who all have weird different behaviors that do they have a blended model do they get specific ones like um I think it was in 2021 or 2022 they talked about how they were helping the teams in the sim with the new tires and what they do is they have this tire deformation model that they've encrypted up the wazoo and they supply it to the teams who put it into their sims they can't introspect into it to see what it thinks about the tire it only they can only drive it through the sim and evaluate it and i just wonder whether the reality is it's probably have just got one model and it's not the brightest button in the box yeah i mean I, I think they're also in a very hard position of like formula one is dictated like these are the kind of tires we want our racers to be on like the, like you know we want them to what fall off a cliff essentially or you know you can run the soft but it gets slower you can run the medium you know we, we know what the tire life is supposed to look like and it just feels like that that doesn't never ever really actually happen no, it doesn't. It's very it's very rare for it to, to truly be like a tire deg race. Yeah, it, and they keep talking about predictability, and the weirdest thing is is I don't think it's predictable. It's not unpredictable, like it's not random, but it doesn't it doesn't conform with what everybody's expectations are, and I think that just messes it, it messes everything up and I think Pirelli need to pull their head out of the rest. Maybe this is where we need Bridgestone, because I think it was Bridgestone did put in a bid for the they 20, did. 26 tires. Yeah. So Maybe. I, I do wonder whether it's worth going back to, I think we talked about this before, going back to multiple tire people, but you can't, you don't ally it with a team. You effectively get random allocation. I, I, I think that it should be, you go in reverse constructor order and you get to pick your tires for the season. So at the end of the 2023 season, you know, if you had Pirelli and Bridgestones, you could say, all right, we get five of each in the, in the worst team, which is currently what Alpha Tauri, they could say, oh, we want Bridgestone. And just and then whoever was fastest gets that choice of tire. Uh, this is a bit of a spicy take, uh, and maybe it's in the wrong section. But uh, Merck intentionally screwed up George's stop to make sure he didn't get in front of Lewis. It was a pretty bad stop for um, George when he did his one stop. I mean, I know he skidded and slid a little bit, but it looked like he actually stopped in the right place. Um, and then it was a full two seconds too slow. It was just a little slow. Um, yeah, but that that really screwed him up because what he ended up behind signs. I think he ended up behind one of the Ferraris that he was he was clear in front of and then it was a slow stop i just think it's one of those things that for a while merc has not needed to have amazing pit stops while that's been like red bull's bread and butter for like the entire (laughs) ever of like we are not going to lose time in this and it it constantly shows of like um 
I saw a thing for one of the mechanics for Red Bull where there's like, uh, I don't think we ever really see it, but there is a banner that goes above the pit garage for like, this is currently the DHL fastest pit stop leader. And apparently it was down at like Aston Martin for a couple weeks and the Red Bull mechanics were like, no, we can't have that. That's not allowed. And now, and now they're like, now it's back home where it belongs. Like, they, And they pride themselves on always having perfect pit stops and it shows. And And it enables you to play with your strategy. Right, like we've talked about Merck making you know, not Ferrari bad, but sometimes they don't make the best pit stop strategy, and sometimes it's because there's that window of opportunity, and because their pit stops are so inconsistent, they either try it and it goes wrong, or they don't try it because they know they're not going to make it, and they need they need to put that time and energy in. Like McLaren have put the time and energy in, as have Aston Martin, um, clearly Red Bull, as you point out, and I feel like it's Merck, Merck need to do that, especially when they're going to try and beat or they're trying to come back from behind, they need to be able to leverage this to try things that they can't otherwise succeed with. Uh, Lewis finally had the safety car luck break his way. Um, that was nice. he got P3. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was nice. But that's why he got P3. He would have been P4, maybe P, even P5, if he hadn't had the safety car break his way. Uh, I do think that there are two, uh, speaking of kind of Lewis and Lewis things, there were two very interesting moments at Cop's Corner uh, this time around. Uh, one was on lap one with how much space Max left Oscar. Holy crap. He almost drove off the track. I wonder why he did that. There's nothing in the past that would suggest that he would need to do that. Never. Not even in 2021. Nothing nothing ever that would suggest that. He maybe has had a visit to that gravel trap before. <laughs> he knows it doesn't slow you down. Um, I don't know if... Did you watch the cool down room at all? I did. I watched... I, I, yeah, I watched it until they muted it. Oh, there, there was a there was a great moment where there's they started the replay back and Max and Lando were talking and he's like and he's like I I was so concerned on lap one I left I left Oscar so much space I was like D- please don't understeer please don't understeer please don't understeer like he literally apparently said that to himself was it because he thought Oscar was the was the rookie and wanted to give him space or flashbacks flashbacks <laughs> he let he left so much space and then on the other hand you had um Lewis chasing down uh, Lan- uh Lando after the safety car restart, and he doesn't go for it at cops. I was I was very disappointed by Lois not taking the opportunity there. I thought that it was right there in front of him. I think he had the um the seven time world champion had the have the chutzpah to be able to go down the inside and he didn't. This does make it really it makes it um curious to me to work out whether Lewis doesn't feel the car could have made it and therefore he backed out because he doesn't trust the car and he's talked about he doesn't have the confidence in the car. Pretty reasonable. Uh, Did he think that he shouldn't try that trick again because it didn't go well for him last time? Also a reasonable place for him to arrive at. He only got a 10 second penalty. It was fine. And won the race because of it. Uh, Or, and I think this is the more interesting point, has he lost his nerve? Because he didn't want, he he was like, oh, I'm not going to do this. It's that, that you know, like I, I I might I might screw it, but not because he was like feeling that he'd screwed it up last time. But overall, he was just being being black states club about it. Lost his nerve since when? Since the last time he had a car that drove forward in a reasonable speed. Because I would say like he has not been, if he ever was, I'd say he definitely had a lot of uh, nerve uh, hustling around the McLaren before he left. Um, you're trying to get that car into good positions and things like that. But then I think he was landed in such a rocket ship in the Mercedes that he hasn't had to fully race in a long time. Since 2016? 2015? 2014? Like, he, did, he had to race surely in 2016. He he went down the inside of Barcelona and took them both out. And whatever happened did the uh, spa that year. And there was another old thing that happened somewhere else. Yeah, but for the most part, like, Lewis was very always heads down focused on the championship at that point in time because he could be. And if like if Max comes underneath you and wins one race, that's fine. 18 points is still plenty to pad my to help my lead. Um and he was definitely playing the long game and I think he just you know, maybe he's a little older, a little wiser, but I I don't think he has that um the car's only going to win one race at one circuit this year. And you gotta hustle it around and make all take all the risks. I think he is a very cool, collective, or a very cool, concerned driver in the sense of, you know, he is going to make every move he can to maximize his position from all those years he was dominating at Mercedes, and it's left him with a little bit of less racecraft. 
a very good racecraft, but a different style racecraft to like, we have three shots this season versus the you can win in any given week. I think I could buy into that. I think it, I think I buy into it more if I look at what's happening to Max. It'll be interesting to see if Max actually gets a competitive driver against him in the same car or another car, and whether he's changed his perspective. Because I can, I attribute to the fact that Max doesn't fear anybody on the entire grid except Lewis, because he doesn't drive the same with anybody else except Lewis. But I wonder whether that becomes changes when there's somebody who is actually capable of beating him. Like in reality, last year he knew he wasn't, didn't have to worry about Charles because Charles was going to bin it or Ferrari was going to screw up. So at the end of the day, there was no point in taking the risk. Yeah, and I think we actually see Max making some of like the same calculus of like you think back to Baku, like Max just did what he needed to do, get the points. He knew Checo was going to, you know, screw up later in the season. He didn't bother pushing it. Like, and, and even then it was it was even some of the bits today of like, I can lose to Lando on the first lap. That's fine. And then I'll wait for the DRS, charge the battery, push on, go past. Yeah, I can I can I can believe that. So maybe in 5 years we're talking about how uh Max has lost it because <laughs> he can't hustle the car like he could. It's Piastri down the inside pushing him off into the wall. There you go. No, he would push uh Oscar off to to complete the cycle. Oh, there you go. There yeah. you go. Yes, yeah, the cycle. In his one last moment before he finally retires in 2028. The next item on the list, uh, I think the Toto Lewis relationship is strained. Uh, after the race, while uh, Lewis was doing his cooldown lap, um, giving it all his platitudes of the team did amazing work, keep fighting, we're going to get this, uh, Toto came on the radio and was like, See, we can improve from a crappy Friday in a defeated tone. Um, it feels like he was annoyed at Lewis and his tone. That was. Um, pretty interesting i think you can also follow this through with uh comments from lewis in the post-race interview saying that it was great to see that mclaren see mclaren's doing well because their family that's where he started his career um, this leaves me holding out for a 2026 lando nando reunion at resurgent mclaren oh yeah that was definitely my uh, uh lewis back to mclaren uh, confirmed oh, yeah there was definitely a moment there they're clearly in negotiations already uh, maybe he'll come out of retirement for it I'm also actually wondering if there's some sort of post-retirement role for him at McLaren. I could see that being the case. Who was, there was somebody else who did this relatively recently who kind of went away for a while and then came back in that. Maybe maybe it's more like a Nicky Lauda type perspective. Yes. Um, but, not, not, but not for Mercedes go back to McLaren. So I've got three items, sorry, two items that go quite hit close together. They're really generic comments. Um, I thought it was interesting that no one got lapped in the entire race, even before the safety car happened. Um which I thought was actually quite interesting. I was surprised that nobody got lapped. Um, uh, the takeaway from this is clearly Red Bull aren't running away from it because if they didn't lap anybody, what's up with that? I thought that was pretty interesting. Maybe maybe the Alpha Tauri and Alpha Romeo upgrades did work. They didn't get lapped. True. Maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way. I'm thinking that they need to move forward in the field and it's just that the field's compressed, uh, which is not what we want. Uh, then my other comment which it, I thought was is quite it interesting. Is it not? Do we not want the field to all be on the same lap racing each other? I only care about the top, like, ten people. If that, maybe the top five. Everybody else is just superfluous and then just traffic and they get in the way. I, I will say that race um, definitely seemed a bit processionally. It, it did, in a, in a, but not in a completely boring way. I do think, like, unlike what, to talk about Baku again briefly, I do think the safety car came out at the exact right time this time around because it was because you had all these runners on mediums that had not pitted and it's like, sweet, nine-second pit stop. This is going to be awesome. Uh, and it was like, well, do we put on the hards that we know are going to make it? Do we put on the softs that we think will make it well? And like seeing that mix of strategy on the restart, because I, I think, and then you had, uh, what Charles who pitted for the ditches hards and go back to the mediums. You had George who started on the soft, went to the medium. So I think like in the top six, you had like, uh, like soft, hard, soft, hard, medium, hard. Like it you had like all three tires in the top six. All colors of the rainbow. Yeah. I thought that was brilliant. No, I thought it was interesting. I thought, think it also shows that that's where you start to see the driver make the difference. Whether it's they make the difference in terms of the strategy you get picked, or it's where they start to make the difference in how they drive. I think it's definitely different. Uh, the other comment I saw, was well, not comment I saw, the thing that I observed was uh, Lewis and Lando's fastest lap, which were both on the same lap, lap 43, were only two one thousandths of away from each other. And then for a pure stats perspective, uh, Max's fastest lap was the lap before and was three tenths faster than everybody else. Uh, anyway, you have Crofty and Martin really want cool, do cool down room drama. What did I miss? I always miss it in the cool down room. 
Uh, they really do. But like, I think in this this era of of Formula One, uh, I don't know if it's just like um, the internet and sim racing makes like Lando, George, and Max just like all much more friends than any sort of like previous eras where we're, I'm going to go back to my home country for six weeks between races. But I feel like the drivers actually get along. Like all of them get along pretty well, and especially the young ones all get along very well. To like, uh, you look when they stepped out of the car, and like both Max and George go to congratulate Lando on his podium. Like they're both like, "This is great, awesome!" And like on the on the the chats with uh, David Coulthard at the end, it was, "Oh hey, like you know Lando drove great today. Oh yeah, it was awesome." Like you know you and then you go to the cool down room, and they're like they're just kind of all chatting about like how great the race was and like complimenting each other and are and like Crofty and Martin want like in some ways, even back not too long ago to like Lewis throwing the hat at, uh, at Nico, which then kicked off Nico's seven race win streak. Uh, something Lewis never did. Is, is this because there's no jeopardy because they ha- they're not actually fighting each other. Like Max knows that Lo- uh, Lando, at least, you know, it's one race. Good for you. Good job, Lando. Have fun with that. I'm just going to go off and win the rest of the races this season. And th- therefore, there is no, um, there's nothing to fight for or, you know, mess with people's brains or psychological uh, warfare between them because there's, n- there's nothing at stake as yet. I don't know, because I'm also seeing this, like, uh, in the cycling world as well at, like, the high level where, like, you know, you have... Um, what at the tour right now, like there, there were scenes of like Pajakar and um, uh, Vindegard, like who are the one and two. I haven't watched today's stage yet. Who are one and two at the time of recording when from everything I've seen, um, you know, they were just chatting and having a chat and a couple little jokes with each other in like the middle of a stage when nothing was happening. Like, I think it's one of these things of we can be super competitive with each other and like fight for wins, but there's no reason like to be nasty with each other outside of that. And I think it's, it's also good sportsmanship and it's nice to see. I think it's good sportsmanship too. I, I think it's, it is nice to see. I think the thing that, that confuses me is what, what is it that's changed? Is it, is it that as a society, despite all the other terrible things that go on, we're actually making progress and realizing that it's better to work together to pull forward or is there something else going on? Are they just taking a lot of drugs? I mean, that could be way of a, a much more positive note than normally we we shed on some sort of podcast. But but yeah, no, I, I think it's I think it's good because uh, to see these sorts of things. I think you even start to see it a little bit more in some of like the American mainstream sports of you know people on other teams not being as mad at each other and be like, yeah, he's he's doing a good job. You know, seeing things like jersey swaps and stuff have have even transcended past like. Uh, the world, the soccer world cup. And like, you see that now in like the NFL of people trading jerseys with each other after the team. I think it's cool. And I think I, I understand why uh, uh, Crofty and Martin Brundle, like they want the drama in the pit room or in the cool down room, but it's, it's, it's just like, uh, you know uh, what Lewis was complimenting the McLaren about like, Oh, how great it was doing, doing the high speed corners. He was following Lando. And he's like, yeah, I just, I was just watching it being impressed. Like he was trying to chase down Lando but at the same point in time. He's like, wow, that car just looks really good going through, like, maggots and beckets. Like, and that that's just, that's very fun for me to see, like, I like them all being friends because I think there's a great thing to, for them, like, and I understand not all of them will be friends, but it's it's definitely just this case of, like, hey, you know, we, we, can, we can fight each other really hard on the track and, like, still go get a beer after the race and it's all okay. I, I think the uh, retirement dinner for Vettel, I think, is an interesting example of that, where everybody's apparently got along and everybody was happy, and the entire entirety of the internet was trying to read everything into the seating positions around the table. Um, but at the same time, like I think they actually did get along, and everybody was pretty happy. I think it's the difference between you don't have to be you don't have to be friends with the people that you race with, but you don't have to hate them, right? And I think that that is the culture that had been bred into a significant amount of sports. That for me to win, you have to lose. And I think it's changed from, for me to win, you just have not to win, which is different from losing. Yeah. And, and like, like especially on a day like today, where the the podium for McLaren, what, their first British Grand Prix podium since, like, 2010? Was that what they were saying? Yeah, like, that's a win for them today. Yeah, it was great. I just hope it continues. Lewis sets, like, what, 14 podiums at a single track, like, that's great for Lewis. Like there was a lot of Max gets six in a row. Like only the what third driver to do that? Fourth, fourth. Schumacher, Senna, and Vettel. I think maybe not Senna. No, no, it was Ascari. Oh, Ascari. That's right. 
Oh, and Rosberg's done it as well. So more than four, but still. What the diff? Four, five, six. <laughs> Who cares? A small number. A small number. Less than ten, more than one. Yeah, so I think it. it's just it's nice to see. I, I like it. Spicy takes and rumors? I think uh, this isn't on the list, but I want to lead off with it. I think McLaren did a very good job, but I think if the tires go back to being more tire-y, uh, where, where we see some d- different... Uh, we see the, like the degradations come back. Um, they talked about how quick McLaren was to warm up their tires, which usually is also code for it's going to monch through those tires. Um, so it'll be interesting to it'll be interesting to see how that holds up when we do like a more high deg, hey, like hungry uh, tire track. Uh, so your spicy take is McLaren was saved by tires. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, I can I can subscribe to that. I, everybody's the the press and the headlines that have been written is McLaren's back. Oh, look at this! And I'm like, no, 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 no. You you need three races, three races. Give them a chance, then you can start it. So if we're if we get to the end of Spa and McLaren is still fighting for the podium, man, they've solved their problem. Until we come back after the summer break. It's also something we've definitely talked about with like Ferrari time and time again. Of like that car is quick over one lap because it warms up his tires so well. And then in the race, it just chomps through those tires because it warms them up so well. Apparently that's Haas's problem is it eats its tires. Which would explain why the Hulk can qualify. Next one. Horner has been saying that Checker will be back in form on Hungary. Uh, my spicy hot take here is, is, what is this? It's not Red Bull. What have you done with them? Because they're saying that, oh, he just needs a hug and some love and Checker will be back in form because we're supporting him and we know that he can do it because he drives it in the race well. He's just not qualifying. Like, this is not Red Bull. Red Bull should be hanging him out to dry and saying that they're having his guts for garters. Uh, my only comment will be uh, Horner's always been a little bit more lovey-dovey. Uh, Helmet Marco is the um, do your job or or else. Emperor Palpatine. They're the very yin and yang of each other. Indeed, I think I can... <laughs> yin and yang, the good cop, bad cop. I'm not sure I'd call Horner the good cop, but I understand what the point you're making. Um, next item. Uh, Mercs still can't correlate their car between the sim and CFD in the real world. Um, Toto took the time a few weeks ago to pimp Mick for doing great sim work, but maybe Mick is actually the problem this year. Maybe he just can't drive a car well and he screws up all the setups. Uh, like there's a meta question here what does what does mick do on a friday and saturday night right he's not at the track um but he can't go out and party because he's got hours and hours of sim work to do what does this mean for his personal life yeah uh, but but more, but back to the serious point i still think mark have a serious problem with the correlation between the sim and the cfd and that's why the car is not making that step forward it's not that they don't have a bunch of engineers what they think it should do it doesn't do what they think it should do, and because it doesn't do what they think it should do, it all goes it all goes to crap. And I think it was you last week who raised the point that they only had one free practice, and the car was pretty bad last week. And this week they had three, and they pulled it together like they've been seemingly uh, able to do when they've had this new upgrade. Um, but I, I, I think that's a really interesting point. Have we entered a case where actually the CFD and tunnel time allocations can be also viewed as a detriment? Because Red Bull is forced to probably do more stuff on track than they normally would, while other teams are relying on CFD and wind tunnel correlations and maybe not seeing the results they want. So they're, they're over, over-analyzing in some ways, maybe. Or are you making the statement that this, everybody's CFD model is off, but Red Bull can't do all that much CFD, so what they do try, they have to try on a track anyway? Yeah, uh, I would say everybody's CFD is off all the time, no matter what, because CFD is not perfect. Uh, back to my aerospace engineering background, I had professors say uh, they CFD modeled a vacuum cleaner at one point in time, and uh, the CFD model said it was breaking the sound barrier, like the the inside vacuuming bits were breaking the sound barrier. So, you know, CFD is a bit, it's complicated. Just to put it, it is complicated. I once wrote CFD software. I didn't understand any of the maths, but I did write it. it. But I think it's only supposed to be an indicator. And I think the teams have to rely on it per our many months ago previous discussion about no on-track testing time. And it doesn't tell them what the real world is really like. That, that's really what the benefit is, is how many hours of on-track out-of-race testing should you get? With uh, If you're going to start including this, say, like, give Red Bull 1 in, what, Alpha Tauri 20, and then draw the line in between there. It's it's a it's a ratio. There should be a ratio as well as the ratio of time. They should ratio it up. So if you do well, you get less, and if you do badly, you get more. And then Pirelli could have more data around their tires. We <laughs> solved it. F one should hire us. Cut print. Check the gate. Uh, 
George is such a conundrum. Uh, we don't seem to like him because he's so far up himself. But yet he seems to be trying to be the a Nando Max Vettel strategizer while zipping around the check. Uh, Lewis does not seem to be this person. Um, he just drives the car and leaves it to the team. The question is, is George just trying too hard? And maybe he should concentrate on honing his driving skills first. Yes. And his empathy. Next. Okay. Uh, rookies, this one's spice take for me. Uh, rookies shouldn't be in F1. Instead, they should run last season's cars with all the drivers that they think should be in F1 and have them do the sprints at every race, every race, and then the points go to the constructor in the World Constructors Drive Championship. This gives those those rookies an opportunity to hone their skills for the entirely different thing because it's the full F1 everything. It's just last year's car, right? And you drive around, you get them to do sprints so they get to, they don't have to do, they take the whole time. It gives the promoters all the time of extra cars on the track going zoom, zoom around that are like cars people care about. And it just moves it forward so that when they do get to F1, A, we know whether they're actually any good or not. And B, they've practiced, they've taken the time, they have the muscles so that when they get going, instead of like, Logan Sargent, Grand Yu Joe last year, um, Piastri this year, where we're like, oh, I don't know, they're, they're all a bit crap because they're still getting into F1. They've had their opportunity to run a whole season, full 24 races, just shorter races. Eh, pass. I'd rather see, I I love, I prefer things like the what the new driver test that like Fernando Alonso took part in at the end of, or at the end of the season. And I also maybe think you add another week of testing or something at the start of the season that's only for rookies or something like that. But the thing that's missing in those situations is the on-track, like, the full cycle of the process, right? Like, yeah, they get the, they improve their neck muscles and they get to familiar with the car, but there's not the pressure. Like, I feel in those situations they need to run a few races. They have to run the process and the system. Then then we should just do mock racing as part of testing. Then I think that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable compromise between them. Okay, here's my spiciest, spicy take of the entire week. Um, Mercedes is actually up for sale and Toto is trying to offload it. Um, that's why he's trying to beat Lewis down on his contract to keep the costs down, and also uh, Toto's tood where he seems to have gotten a bit cranky. Um, Toto keeps going around uh, telling people, people the, the F1 people, that they should, the new people that want to come to F1, that they should buy a team, not start a new one, right? 4D hyper chess, you should buy a team. Conveniently, I've got one here that I'm happy to sell to you. Um, what, what, what's your take on that? Because there's an interview where he said this, that, like, yet yeah, today, in fact. He said, you should go buy a new team. Buy a new team? Sorry, buy a team. Sorry. Buy I, I don't... Buy a team, and that's how you get into F1. I don't like the idea of buying a team. No, but, I, I, but I, this yeah. is about Toto. This is Toto's exit plan. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, it, it does seem like Toto is falling out of love with F1 a little bit, and he might be looking for a way out. Uh, my, uh, my my final comment on this specific one is that if you're going to go and buy a team uh, General Motors should buy two teams they should buy Alpine and Haas and then run it like Red Bull and Toro Rosso sorry uh, Alpha Tori that'd be fine alright well would you like my spiciest spice take from the weekend yes I think Red Bull's dominance is nearing its end at least for this season that is quite a spicy take everybody's chasing Red Bull right we, we know this and, and you know there are teams saying that uh, we're you know we're we're this close to Red Bull. We, we you know we think in this couple of things they're going to keep bringing upgrades. Meanwhile, Red Bull's kind of made no secret that they have already started working on next year's car, or at it, least it's been discussed that like they are already looking ahead. Uh, Max is leading the constructors' championship by himself. Uh, I haven't looked up the math yet, but I'm pretty certain like they're going to be able to wrap up like the construct. It's getting to the point of like. Um, I think I saw something of, like, for Lewis to win the World Drivers' Championship, he would need to win, like, every race, every sprint race, get every fastest lap, and Max would need to, like, finish eighth, like, like, like eighth, like, three times. Uh, and, like, that's what it would take. Like, and, and I think to some extent, I think they've stopped developing this car because it does seem like teams are creeping closer and closer to them. And I think it. I think we could end up with kind of like almost a 2009 Braun GP season where like they blast out to such a lead, and then by like after the summer break, I could see them not winning as many races just because they're like, well, we have it pretty much locked up. Because like, is Max going to slide out of the points? No, but if he keep, but if he finishes like P3, P4, he still gets enough points, and I think he still continues to go on and win the the, the championship. So I think they've already. I, I would not be surprised if they actually really have already started working on the 
the 2024 car. You know that you have a limited amount of time because you're penalized this year. You know you have a limited amount of time because you're going to sweep everything this year, so you're not going to have as much time. Might as well just start working on the next car to get a, to get a leg up on everybody. But you assert it's only for this season. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think they are set for the next little bit. I'm saying that for this season that they're... I, I don't think we're going to see them win every single race this season. I think by the time we hit, like, September that, you know, it could be other teams starting to battle for the win and Red Bull's totally okay with that because they're going to have everything wrapped up in like the next, like almost by the summer break. In fact, Checo's letting them down because if he was up there and they were doing one twos, they might already have the damn constructors wrapped up. Like, because here's the thing, like also if you look at who's chasing them, it's not consistent week in and week out. It's not like it's Ferrari nipping at their heels or it's Aston Martin nipping at their heels. It changes every single track of like who the second best car seems to be. So if that's the case, it's like, oh cool, we have round robin going on for like the next points after us. That means no constructor is really a threat. So why why are we still developing this car when we can start focusing on next year's car? I, I can subscribe to that. I think that why are we endangering getting caught with the budget cap once more? Once more, because we can spend the money on the 2024 car, but in a more uh, conservative fashion, because we're not fighting for anything. Right. And Max can break on the odd wing on the pit lane, and that's fine. We're not going to let go over our budget. It was probably 150 grand worth of front wing. Uh, I can subscribe to this theory, except I think everybody's reading too much into uh, a Mercedes step forward uh, a few races ago. And McLaren's step forward. I think people are reading too much into it. I, I agree that Mc, uh, Red Bull are not bringing any upgrades. I think they brought some small cooling upgrades, which they said were circuit-specific uh, this weekend. I can subscribe to that. I just think everybody else still doesn't know what they're doing. I think nobody else understands the car. The, the, the question, I think the thing that's really open is, do Red Bull understand the car? I think they probably do, but there's still a good chance that they just happen to build a good car. There's a difference between building a good car and intentionally building a good car. So I was actually, there, there was some news of like Adrian Newey like sees the end of his career coming. He, he knows he's going to retire soon. There was some of that between them. And I've actually, and he still apparently designs every car like on paper first with, without CFD. And I'm wondering, given some of the other chats we've had about like CFD on this podcast, I'm wondering how much that is actually a benefit just in the sense of like, there's a there's a thing in, in cycling with like time trialing positions of like if it looks fast, it's probably fast. Um and that Adrian Newey just knows enough about aerodynamics that he's like, Yeah, this is probably going to work. Yes, this is probably where air is going to get pinched on like the underside of the car and things like that. And he can probably get ninety five percent of the way there just like with the knowledge he has and drawing the car. And then instead of spending his all of all of his time messing around um and like modeling programs to model all this and run cfd they know this is a good starting point just from like he knows how to build a car and then you know where you're going and then you don't have to worry about cfd as much there was always the comment that adrian newey one of his true talents was the fact that he could see the airflow like he had the sixth sense of being able to see the flow lines and i think that your point here is that and i think i subscribe to it is that teams have become overly reliant on defining their paradigm for their car by attempting to optimize instead of building the car first by using intuition to get to the starting point to set their paradigm and then optimizing it and i I can subscribe to that i especially think that's how merc ended up with the note with the zero pods last year is i think they were like oh let's put some maths into this and then magic and look what we got here and then it looks like it's going to be amazing and it wasn't um, I think there's a corollary to, you know, people use AI. AI is a great way to optimize. It is not a great way to start, right? All the generative AI stuff is like, we've we've lifted everybody else's crap um, rather than starting from something unique that then you use to refine. Yeah, and I think you also then will have, have a better understanding of the car in the sense of like, we believe this bit should do this because of X, Y, and Z instead of like, well, we plugged it into the computer and we liked the number that came out. okay. You have causality, or you believe you have intuitive causality, 
why x does y. Because you said that you were going to make x do y, and does it do, does x do y? Okay, great, now we can fix it. Versus at the moment, you're like, well, I'm expecting the result x, and it involved a 4D hypercube. I, I don't know why it works, but it's supposed to go quicker, so let's go with it. I mean, it's one of those things of what we have the Bernoulli equation, we should be able to know like, oh, airflow is going from this this volume to this volume underneath the car. This should produce this much downforce. It, I totally agree. It was interesting on that uh, tangent about equations. Was it le- late in 2021? Maybe it was early 2022. Um, somebody got a Nobel Prize or some other Fields Medal or something because they came up with the equation that helps you understand the separation where you have the flow against the solid surface. Somebody actually worked out and was like, oh, we've got it now. And I was surprised that I didn't see that talked about in F1 because then you can truly model the underneath of the car because you can do the whole nine yards. Um, I wonder if maybe somebody has pulled that into their CFD and maybe that will help them do it. Actually, maybe what they did is they pulled it in and it was all wrong and that's why Merck can't build a car to go forward. Yeah, and then like speaking back to CFD, like for in the in the bicycle world, it, it for years it was spinning wheels are actually very hard to model. Like that's, it, they're very hard to model. Like you can do, like airplanes are easy in that sense because the airplane is not spinning through the air. Ho- hopefully. Um, hopefully. <laughs> Bad, bad design if it is. <laughs> Unless it's a helicopter. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but yeah, so it's interesting. All right, uh, let's 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 wrap this up. Okay. Uh, crazy but plausible predictions for Hungary are Perez misses Q3 again. I, I am definitely testing it at this point, but I think it's possible. Uh, at this point, I think the crazier prediction is Prez makes Q3. Fair point. I will. Uh, yes, uh, we we can, we should we should do that and see what happens. See, do, we should do both, and we're guaranteed one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, next item on the list is uh, Merck slides back even more. I think this is a slam dunk at this point. I don't. They don't understand the car. Uh, I will. I want some clarification on this because, like, slide back from who are they currently in front of that they will then be behind. Because there's not much more sliding back room to go. True. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, I was about to say they're going to slide back behind Ferrari, but that would require them to go quite a long way. Uh, and then I was about to say they're about to fly, slide back behind Aston Martin, but that would also require them to go quite a long way. I can't believe I'm about to say this, and I know they DNF'd, but I think it's sliding behind Alpine. Okay, so you, so you think one Merc will at least finish behind one Alpine? Yes. Okay. I'm writing this down. <laughs> I can't believe I just had to go through that thought process. All I know is I truly, deeply believe they will be slower, but you have raised a very interesting point that everybody else isn't doing very good either. Uh, Next on the list, uh, McLaren continues good performance, but they will not be as good as they were at Silverstone. Yeah, I'll subscribe to that. I think that's, and that's, I think, something that we talked about with, like, the tires and the warm-up on tires and Hungary being a very turny circuit. Like, that'll be interesting to see how well they do. Next on the list, uh, I predict that Ferrari will not move forward and they will cook their tyres. Even more so than they normally do. This is another one of those, like, does not go forward from where? Like, losing to Alp- or losing, <laughs> losing to the Aston Martins and Mercedes and McLarens? They will not make any forward progress relative to those other teams. They will not move in front of any team that they are behind currently. Okay. Who, who, who are they currently behind? <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna put this down. They were, they were like what? They were P9 and P10. Yeah, by by strategy, and in quality they were in quality they were the third fastest car. They were fourth and fifth. I predict that Ferrari will slide behind in qualifying Aston Martin. Okay, and in the race, I predict that Ferrari will slide behind Alfa Romeo. Okay. Uh... Next one is first driver changes will get full-throated rumors. This is my prediction that at this race, um, we're going to get some proper solid rumors about driver changes, but only from the teams that forgot that Hungary is not the race before uh, the summer break. It's actually Spa, which is two weeks after that, because normally it's Hungary, and some team's going to leak it, and they're going to have forgotten about it. The only one I put on the list is, uh, I think Danny Rick is going to impress at the tire test in Silverstone. I think he will. And I can't decide whether to say it's not difficult to disappoint when you're against Perez or it's not easy to disappoint when you're against Perez or just because Danny Rick has got his vibe back and he'll do a pretty good job getting in the car. Yeah, I I think that could be the case of like, I think these next two races for Perez are actually hypercritical in the sense of Max is clearly Max is winning the Constructors Championship on his own. Do we put Danny in the car for the second half of the year? Here's here's, Here's what they should really do. If Max can keep pulling this off, 
they should save all the money and run one car a race. Oh, I, I have a different strategy on that fact. If Max really does like pull this or like, well, we should find out the earliest time he could clinch. As soon as he clinches, pull him out and put Danny Rick in and let him and Checo race uh, for for the last uh, for the seat next year. You've suggested this before, uh, and I think it would be fun. I'm just not sure that they'll actually do it. No, they won't do it, but they should do it. They should do it. They should do it. I don't understand why, and I'm sure there's like some contracts in it. But like, if you if you've clinched where you are, I, I think if, if I can make one rule change to Formula One, it's if if you have clinched your driver standing position, as in you cannot get any better or any worse, you are done for the season. What does that mean when you're at the back, which may happen pretty early in the season? No, that's not true. Because like, like there's still 26 points out there, and for a race win, you could vastly improve your position. Only, when, uh, but only, only, only if you are 26 post, percent, 26 points behind somebody else. But the possibility is that somebody's like you know got six sevens and they're doing okay or whatever. I think that it knocks out the front runners pretty early, but I think it knocks out the back runners as well. All right, and eleventh is Oscar Piastri at set with seventeen, Pierre Gasly at sixteen, Alex Albon at eleven, Valtteri. Uh, Val- oh wait, where are we? Uh, Nico Hulkenberg at nine, Bottas at five, Guan Yu Zhou at four, Sonoda at two, Magnussen at two, Logan at zero, Nick DeVries at zero. These can all leapfrog each other, so they are not locked into their positions mathematically. I'm saying that when when Max can't. When he's when nobody can catch him, he's done for the season. Red Bull has to run somebody else in the car. If Checo can or can figure out a way to lock up P two, he's done. You have to put another. This is how you get your rookies in to get them experience. Yes, there we go. I was just I was just reaching the same conclusion. Yeah, you have to put somebody else in the car. Give somebody else a chance. I will support that, and that means that means that you can get to even more races in a year from the from the team's perspective. Because you'd be able to change everybody out and you'd be able to give people more chance. Because you don't need your best um, pick crew if your team has won everything already and you can give new people a chance, which means you can rotate them out. It's the solution. They can have 52 races a year. Problem solved. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's how we get to 52 races in 2052. Perfect. 52 for 52. And on that note, I think it's time to end. Uh, thank you so much for listening to Tinfoil Helmets. Uh, once again, we are awaiting your feedback, if you have any feedback. Uh, so don't forget to like, subscribe, rate uh, rate us on any listening platform you choose to listen to us on. Tell your friends, because we certainly have, which is probably why you're here. Uh, also, write into feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com if you have anything you want to let us know. Uh, your conspiracy theories, your feedback, your wants. Uh, who McLaren will finish behind in Austria? Uh, yeah. So with that, we'll see you in one week. One, no, two weeks. Two weeks for the Hungary, Hungarian, Hungar, at the Hungaro Ring.